we're still at that turning point, aren't we? We're still kind of close enough to the beginning of the year that we're looking at those changes that we might make in our lives. One of the best ways to do that is to think of someone in your life who made a profound difference, someone who for you has been a kind of guiding star, someone you could always turn to, go to, speak with, and it would be almost like standing near someone who's kind of warmer, almost like a fire that you could gather around on a cold night. The life we live with God, it's really meant to be like that for other people. And God lights that fire in worship and through his word. To be that kind of person, God invites us to change, to make a choice, to choose to change. One of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. It's not spirit control. We're given that gift to exercise self-control. We're going to look today at John the Baptist. If ever somebody was someone who people kind of gathered, they left the town behind and they went and saw this person. John the Baptist was that kind of person. Jesus praises John for being different, for standing out as a prophet against Pharisees, Sadducees, even Herod Antipas, the king. And Jesus highlights this interesting difference about John. Just talked about it in the children's message. What John wears, his clothing. Why did he do that? Is it important? Let's look at Matthew chapter 11, beginning at the second verse. It's on page 992 in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's places. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. A group of college students, freshmen, are brought in by psychologists to test a theory. Does what you wear fundamentally change who you are? What you can do, even how well you do it. The college graduates, for example, were to wear a doctor's lab coat, white lab coat. When they met with high school students and their parents, would they receive more respect? Study found that not only were they treated with more respect because they looked more professional, but they themselves felt kind of subconsciously more professional. Maybe you've heard that expression, clothes makes the man, makes the woman. Dress for success, dress for the job you want. The new scientific study just mentioned it did a couple of things. First, it confirmed something, but that's not just a hunch. Women, men who wear more business-like clothes to an interview, more likely to be hired. People who dress conservatively are perceived as self-controlled, reliable, wear something more daring, thought of as more attractive, individualistic. Think Walter Cronkite, Lady Gaga, right? 
Second, this new study told us something I think important for today. When we dress differently, it changes us on some level. We think not only with our brains, but also with our whole body. The whole thing's connected, including the clothes that we wear. Wear a doctor's white lab coat, you're gonna be a little more focused. Wear street clothes, things might be different. So in one experiment, 58 people wore a lab coat or street clothes. Then they took a test where they had to spot items that didn't belong in a set. So got a whole list of things. What does, you know, one of these things is not like the other, right? Those in white coats made half as few errors as those in street clothes. One of the best ways to stand out to be different is just to wear something different. It changes how people see us. It also seems to change on some level who we are. Maybe we don't need a scientific study to tell us that, that people judge us by the clothing we wear, that the clothing we wear may change on some level who we are. Let's look at an episode from the Elijah the prophet, because this is a part of his story. It's strongly connected with the one I just read from Matthew. And it helps us to answer this question. This is our question for today. How does God call us to choose to be different? Is it enough to change the externals? Not just what we dress, but maybe where we live or different parts of our environment. Can we change all of that and sort of work from the outside in? Or does it need to be from the inside out? Elijah famously confronted Ahab and Jezebel, king and the queen, because they were dividing their time between worshiping God and worshiping Baal, another god. God was with Elijah judged Ahab and Jezebel, but Ahab and Jezebel didn't repent. They didn't choose to change. Even after experiencing God's judgment firsthand and their son Ahaziah, he did the same. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. Ahaziah was hurt while working on his house. Instead of committing himself to God and his care, he went to another God for healing, Baalzebub. Does that name sound familiar? Ahaziah didn't even go himself to the temple of Baalzebub. He sent messengers in his place. That kind of tells you something, right? Go check that out, see if it's worth my time. Just wants a fix. He doesn't really care where it comes from. An angel told Elijah to intercept the messengers and say, did you forget about the real God, the God of Israel? Because you have tell your king he won't recover. The messengers returned, told the king the bad news, and the king, the king asks this, what kind of man was he who came to you, told you these things? They answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a leather belt around his waist. And Ahaziah, the king says, that's Elijah, the Tishbite. So there it is. The first thing they noticed about Elijah was what he wore. It kind of stood out to the messengers. It was what told Ahaziah right away that this was Elijah, up to no good, making trouble for him and his family. So the clothes, in some sense, again, they make the man. They tell you who this person is. But here's the thing. It's not like Elijah put on the camel's hair coat and the leather belt that made him into a prophet. None of those external things change him into someone who chooses to be different, to stand against the king and the queen, now his son. The clothing marks him out as someone different from others, but the clothing, the change in the externals, it doesn't give him the spiritual authority or the change at the heart level that makes him who he is. You can imagine a young boy who follows Elijah. He's taken by the story, he's inspired by the bravery, goes to his mom and dad and says, make me an outfit just like Elijah's. He wears it, he imitates Elijah, comes home despondent. None of these external changes make the young boy a prophet, of course. These changes in his clothing might give him extra bravery, but they wouldn't change him fundamentally. The college graduates who wear the white coat, eventually that coat comes off. They don't become doctors. They get a little more respect, they might do their jobs a little bit better, but they haven't changed, not in a fundamental way. The question that Ahaziah asks his messenger, that's the real question. What kind of man 
is this? It's the question for each of us. What kind of man, what kind of woman are you? Elijah was a prophet, a person called by God to draw near to him, to speak his word, to be so different that people could not miss that he belonged to God, to be so different that people would gather around him to find out who is God, what is God up to? Why spend this time reminding ourselves about Elijah? Two answers, because of Jesus and because of James. Jesus says that John is the Elijah that is promised before the return of the Messiah. He praises John particularly for being a prophet, someone called by God who draws near to God in prayer so that he can be God's person in public. He draws near to God in prayer so that he can be God's person in public. We have that same part. We're not being called to be a prophet. We are called to be a prophetic sign and wonder in the world. We are, all of us. As we draw near to God in prayer, we become more and more his people in public. We become like a fire that other people want to gather around on a cold day. It sounds good today, doesn't it? The call, it's not to change the externals, clothing, whatever, but to be changed through prayer. If we do that, we will be different. We won't fit in exactly with everybody else. In John's case, he was called and willing to be so different, so much God's own person that he landed in jail. Now you might say that's fine for John, for Elijah. They're prophets, they're special. That kind of dedication in prayer that we might be different in public, I don't know that that's for me. That leads us to our second answer, because James, because Jesus, because James. Why talk about Elijah? Because the letter of James, we read this. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months, it did not. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain and the earth for its fruit. This is not the only place in the New Testament where we hear this. Again and again, the call is clear. God's people are to draw close to him in prayer so that they are different in public, so that we can be his prophetic people. That's our challenge this morning. Ask God to light a fire in our hearts that we can carry into the world by doing this. Return. Brothers and sisters, friends, return to a life in prayer if you've left it behind. Or if you're already in that life of prayer, go deeper, go stronger in this next season. When you do this, you will change. God will change you, trust me. You will change. Henry Blackaby says this, great pastor and theologian. Once you've determined to follow God by faith, and you have made the adjustments, daily, calendar, specific adjustments, you must obey. When you do what he tells you, no matter how impossible or bewildering it may seem, God carries out what he purposed through you, through you. Not only do you experience God's power and presence, but so do all those who observe you. I love that last sentence, but so do all those who observe you. The change they see, it's not just going to be something you wear, new circumstances. It's going to be a heart. It's going to be a life on fire with God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.